Good evening. Thanks so much for coming. You guys are in for a treat tonight. Um, before I introduce Deb, why don't we start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the abundant blessings you give, upon, give to us every day. We pray for our speaker, Deb Hadley, this evening, that you will enlighten her, give her wisdom and knowledge and grace as she speaks to us. Give us hearts and ears that are willing to listen, to hear your voice, Lord, and have it speak to our hearts. Thank you for our abundant blessings, and let's say a prayer to Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let me introduce to you Deb Hadley. Deb Hadley is an amazing woman who has had an amazing journey in her life. She's an inspirational speaker who travels from coast to coast, so we are very fortunate to have her here. She's from Alexandria, Minnesota. Currently, she is a bereavement manager for Knud Nelson Hospice, where she manages quite a lot. She is an author and the creator of the Morning God Boost, an almost daily Facebook blog. Uh, she has her master's in te teaching. She's been in her past a 4-H coordinator. She has a lot of certifications, and I can't remember what they all are. I'm sorry. So, and most of all, I have to introduce Deb Hadley as my friend. Please help me welcome Deb. Okay, you can hear that, can't you? Yeah, certifications. Um, thank you, Chris. Yeah, I think the most important is that she's my friend. Uh, and uh, you'll find she really saved my life in a lot of ways. I am incredibly grateful for her and just incredibly grateful to be here to share with you my story. Um, certifications, I'm certified in death and grief studies. Doesn't that, don't you want to hang out with me? So I, <laughs> I do bereavement work for hospice and so I help people after their loved ones have passed away. Uh, for 13 months, and I'm a grief to gratitude uh, certified coach. So um, I, I am around a lot of, uh, I am also a spiritual care provider for hospice. And so when people are out, in the, uh, you know, actively passing away, I get the privilege to be able to be with them and walk them to heaven, which is one of the greatest gifts uh, that I think anyone could ever have. And yet, uh, I would, would never have chosen this profession ever. Um, I'm really a teacher. That's what I really am. Uh, but God directed me in this path. And so um, looking at this, it just says, over 2,000 years ago, God sent his son with an extraordinary purpose. And never forget that he has great things planned for you. And I know that I was talking to Irene, Chris's uh, daughter, and we were talking about her job. And she said, you know, it's just not ideal right now, but it's, it's good. She goes, but I don't know what my ideal job is but we never really know really what our God's plan is for our lives. We just open it up to him. But he takes very ordinary people and he does extraordinary things with them. And I am just as ordinary as, you know, Simon Peter the fisherman. I'm as ordinary and he, he just takes us through our hardships and does extraordinary things. And so I just wanted to start out, is this echoing or can you hear me okay? You okay? All right. Good. So I just wanted to take you through, I'm hoping through my story, some of the hardships that I have had um, and the way that uh, God has helped me to be able to live really a joy-filled life despite the hardships, um, that it can help you. Because I'm fully aware that each and every one of you have a story. And you could be up here. Yesterday I was at Shirley's business and every person that's there has a story. And you all have a story of hardships that happen in your family, in your life, and I know you have a story as well. And so hopefully I can learn from you and you can learn from me. But you know, growing up, this is, I feel like this when we grow up, don't you have a plan for your life? I mean, I just knew that I was gonna be a professional ice skater and I can't ice skate at all. <laughs> so I, but I just, you know, I just remember watching Dorothy Hamill, I was gonna be a professional ice skater, but you know, I was going to, I, I knew that I would make it through high school and graduate. I was certain I would go to college and then after college, I would, I would get a great job that I loved. And then I got the job, then I would get my home, and then I would get married, and then I would have children, and they would all be perfect. They would all come to church, and they would all, you know, life would be good. And that's how, that's the plan. It, did that happen to you guys in your plan too? Was that, was that your plan too? But we find that 
In this, it says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. It's John 16, 33. And it's a Bible verse that is really, um, I think, describes my life in so many ways, is that the, the Lord says, in this world you will have troubles. And over, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of times in the Bible, if you read scripture, it, it, it's always like, you're going to have trouble, it's going to be hard, there's going to be suffering, you're going into exile, you know, take them across the Red Sea, take them into the land of Canaan, this is going to be tough. Joshua's like, how do I do er, Every single one of them are thinking, like, how do you think I can do this? David's running for his life. Every story in the Bible, I think there's hardship. And then God shows how he's there and how they cry out to him and how good can come from it. And there were four things that I had heard on a podcast about this Bible verse, is that the first thing with troubles is that they're normal. So that if you've had troubles in your life, it's, you didn't do anything wrong. Sometimes there's people who go, well, of course, that would happen to me. Or what did I do? What did I do to deserve this? But it's normal to have troubles in this world. And the second thing is that you should expect it. And so if you're fortunate now to never have had a big blow of any kind in your life, you should expect that somehow you'll have a big blow. Because I, unfortunately, and fortunately, um, I did hear in the Seneca, Kansas area that there's a 100% mortality rate right here. So I'm sorry to tell you that this is in Kansas only. So that's you guys. Uh, but but the, the truth is, is that everybody you see, every person, every partner, everyone you see, one will have to go before the other. It just happens. And then the other person is going to have to learn how to live in this world without that person and be able to survive and thrive in this world. And so the first thing is, so it's normal. The second thing is you should expect it. The third thing is that it is very purposeful. Because I think in my life with the suffering I've had and the suffering that you've had, if we're supposed to suffer to just suffer, doesn't that stink? It's just like, oh, to suffer to just suffer. All this happened and all I do is I'm miserable every day and I just suffer and there's just more suffering and I'm just miserable and I just keep going and you just spin out of control. Really? You know, the Lord, we know that if we open our hearts to the Lord, we bring him in, that he can heal us from the inside out, that there's great things that can happen through great suffering so that it is very uh, purposeful. And then the last thing is that it's powerful because truly in the pains of hell, uh, when you're so rock bottom, so low, there's a beauty there that you'll only get in deep suffering. It's the closest to the Lord when you feel like you can't live and he's the only one who can pick you up and move you forward. And it's super powerful. And so if you're going through some major suffering right now, don't miss out on the beauty that comes from it. Like, Lord, what is the beauty in this suffering? Rather than dreading it and wanting to run from it, embrace that suffering because there truly is beauty in that suffering. So this is more about what happened to me in my life. <laughs> it says sometimes God doesn't do the things the way we think he should, but God has a perfect plan for your life. I mean, really, does it even make sense of some of the things that have happened in life? Can you even like, uh, you know, his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our, th our thoughts. I'm not even going to try to figure it out why things have happened. But it's true. It's like you're going along and all of a sudden a big blow. And it might not be with you. It might be with one of your children. It might be some type of addiction in your family. It might be addiction with you. It might be you might come out of it. Then there's a broken relationship. And then you climb out of it. And then someone, so often you hear children falling away from the church. They've fallen away from the faith. And then, they, and then you crawl back out of that too. And then there's a divorce. And then there's loss. And there's just so many hardships. And, and life is not just a straight path. It is this. It's a roller coaster of climbing up the hill and falling down again every time. And the big part is to really trust God in the middle of all that. And so unconditional faith. I think this is a super important thing for us to think about. Unconditional faith. Unconditional faith. Uh, what does unconditional faith mean to you? Since you're in the front row, I'm going to... What, what's unconditional faith? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to believe no matter what. It's like no matter what happens, I'm going to trust you. Even if I prayed and it didn't turn out how I wanted, I'm going to, no matter what. And that's just it. Trusting God no matter what happens. And if you would say to me, you know, like, oh, do you have unconditional faith? Yes, yes, I have unconditional faith. I'm going to, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Like, I trust him no matter what. Is God first in your life? Absolutely. He is first and foremost in my life. I absolutely and I bet you many of you would say that same thing. So I think it's when true suffering and testing comes into your life 
that's when you find out if you really do have uh, unconditional faith. And so I'm going to share with you my journey through my family. And aren't they so cute? Aren't they just like, yes, thank you very much. This, this is my such a cute family. This was a Christmas card in 2012. And so I'll introduce them to you. My husband, Scott, is on the very far right. Um, we live in Alexandria, Minnesota. Scott, uh, we, we lived in Sleepy Eye, which is a little town in southern Minnesota. Um, and Scott was a school teacher. I, I was a teacher as well. And he, um, he knew that he wanted to live up in Alexandria by a lake. And teacher, as a teacher, he got to retire at 56. And yeah, I know, he did. And uh, 56, and he is now 60, he's going to be 62 or 3, I don't even know. But he is, uh, he is really the best retired person I've ever known in my life. He, he does it well. <laughs> he just does it well. He takes good care of me. Um, and uh, as beautiful as this family is, there's a lot of hardships in it too. Um, so Scott and I were both married before and divorced. And so we have a blended family. And so that's the first hardship, especially for our kids. And so um, that they had to be a statistic of divorce, that they had to be a part of it and how hard it was for them to go, you know, from, you know, themselves to now having all kinds of different siblings. So Scott came into uh, the marriage with Jesse, Jessica, who's standing next to him. I used to always call her my stepdaughter, but she said I would like to be called a bonus daughter and not a step. So she's my bonus daughter. And then she was uh, seven years old when she came into my life. And then Josh is over here, right here, Josh. And uh, he was nine, seven and nine. So they're full brother and sister. In the white, this is Kaylee, and she was five. And um, she is mine, my daughter from my first marriage. And then Tyler is in the middle, and he's ours. So we're his, hers, and ours. Jesse was married to Jacob, and, or is married to Jacob, and that little boy is my grandson, Connor, in 2012. And like I said, it's a beautiful family picture, but we know that in family, like if this were a Christmas card, if I were writing a letter to you, I would tell you all the good things that are happening in this family. And I would not tell you all the crud, because <laughs> every family has crud, don't they? I, I'm sure you could say, oh my gosh, yeah. And uh, this family has a lot of troubles too, and a lot of beauty as well. And so Jesse, Jessica and uh, um, Jacob, they now have uh, these four boys. And I, I just, my little Connor, he looks so much, he's the one next to me, he looks so much like Tyler, and so I just think that that's just a, a good, uh, yeah, good clone of him. And then we have twins, Grant and Riley, and then we have our grandson, uh, Patrick. So those four boys. Oh, that's a phone. So I should tell you, you should turn your phones on, because if they go off, then you owe me $20. And that's, <laughs> that's, how, that's how I make money. And actually, you should give Chris your phone number. Chris, start calling people. So everybody's phone goes off, OK? <laughs> and then at the end, I'll do really, it'll go to the foundation. It'll be good. So. All right, good. So, <laughs> all right. So, if you don't want to pay me money, then shut your phone off. Okay. Um, so, uh, and then Josh is married to Miranda, and they have a little boy. His name is Kyler, and a little girl named Kendall. So, we have five. And so, these are all my bonus grandchildren as well, uh, and they live four miles from us, and it's just it's fantastic. And so, my story really that I talk about is Kaylee. Uh, and Tyler, because that's really where my hardships come in, and it's their story that I can share with you. So let's talk with Kaylee. Um, Kaylee, here's Kaylee's plan. Uh, Kaylee also was going to be a professional ice skater, and was just like her mother and could ice skate at all. It just, it just didn't happen. You know how boys want to be professional basketball players? They want to be Michael Jordan, or they're going to be a professional football player. Anyway, Kaylee decided, she graduated from high school, and then she um, wanted to be an English teacher. So uh, Keely went to college at Mankato State University in Minnesota, and unfortunately for her, it was not part of the plan that she would be diagnosed with epilepsy. So in 2021, she had a grand mal seizure. Um, apparently, uh, Keely, when she was little, about five years old, she started to flutter her eyes like this. And we thought it was a nervous tick because that's when the divorce went through and it was just, so we thought it was a nervous tick. So her whole life, she flooded her eyes. She would even be in the, uh, 
the, uh, the huddle with the basketball team and she would flutter her eyes and the coach would say, quit rolling your eyes, Kaylee. And she's like, oh yeah, sorry. Or she would go to a window intentionally and I would say, what are you doing, Kaylee? And she's like, oh, I'm just stretching my eyes. You know, uh, never once, now thinking back, you know how like, oh, why didn't I? Yeah, it was something going on in her brain. It wasn't a nervous tick. And so the doctors told us that he asked when she had the grand mal seizure, did she ever flutter her eyes when she was little? And I'm like, oh my gosh, all the time. Like, it irritated me, like all the time. And he goes, those absence, they were absence seizures and you either grand mal into them, most people grow out. So she grand mauled into them. And so the first year she had seizures, it was just maybe two a year. Um, the second year she had seizures, it was maybe like six a year. And the third year she had seizures, they were like maybe like every other month. So it's like, so she started to have more and more seizures. Um, Kaylee, her ju she wanted to be an elementary school or a, a high school school teacher. I never would want to be a high school school teacher ever. Um, but she was a high school school teacher and she taught English. Um, she directed plays. She was student counsel, just loved by everybody. And then Kaylee wanted to get married and she met the love of her life, Kurt. And uh, the plan was that they were gonna get married in, in uh, January 25th of or 2014 and everything was going great. Everything was going great until a storm hit. And the, storm of, uh, the storms of life will hit out of the blue, out of nowhere, and then we have to figure out how we're gonna navigate these storms. Uh, things were not going according to plan for us. And this particular day, I'm taking you back now, it will be 11 years in June. It was June 5th, 2013. And this particular day, Kaylee was down at Martin County West as a school teacher. Kaylee uh, resigned her teaching job because she was gonna move to Sleepy Eye, teach summer school, and then get married and then move to the cities on June 5th. So what happened that day is that she had her last teacher workshop. She had to clean out her room. She had going away parties. She had been packing her apartment because she was actually moving out of her apartment. Then she was going to come home that night. I knew she'd be home at about 9.30, quarter to 10. I was uh, running the 4-H program and so I was at a federation meeting for you 4-Hers. And so I got home, it was like 9.30, quarter to 10. So I called her on the phone and she didn't answer. I'm like, hey, Kaylee, I thought maybe she stopped at a friend's house. Hey, Kaylee, it's mom. You know, I'm home, just waiting for you. Just come on, you know, just, just waiting for you. I remember to um, the Keely, the bedroom that she was staying in uh, was originally my son Tyler's bedroom. And he loved the Tennessee Volunteers. And so the whole room was orange, like Tennessee Volunteers. And there were, one wall was a checkerboard and it had a big T for Tyler, but for Tennessee, but it was all orange. And so we had surprised her and we painted the whole room for her. So it was like beige and cinnamon. I had a new bedspread. I hung up all these pictures above her bed. It said, may the Lord bless and keep you. It was all this. And I remember putting a picture of Kaylee and my mom and I on the dresser. We had, it was the three of us who had gone to Chicago for a trip with Kaylee for her graduation. And I remember this overwhelming feeling that we were going to lose my mom. And so I wanted to make sure that Kaylee knew that we have to go on another trip with mom because I feel like she's not going to be with us very long. And I put that on the dresser. It was about quarter after 10, 10.30. Now I'm getting tired. I call Kaylee. She didn't answer. And I'm Kaylee, you know, I don't know if you stopped at Chris's. Where did you go? I said, well, I'm going to go to bed. When you get home, let me know. About quarter after 11, 11.30 that night, my husband had been in Alexandria at our lake home, came home and came up the steps and you know, wakes me up and I say, hey, is Kaylee here? And he's like, no, I, I haven't seen her. I, I, she's not here. I was like, and instantly in my heart, I was just like, oh my gosh. Like, she, she, would, not, she would not have done this. She, I, she knew she needed to come home. She would not have done this. So I'm calling people, trying to get people to answer their phones. And her friend Mary, who's one of her teacher friends, answers the phone. She's like, Deb, she, she should have been home long ago. She, she left at 6 o'clock. She should have been home long ago. So Mary goes, I will drive over there and I'll let you know she's there. Pretty soon I get a call from Mary. She's like, Deb, we're here. Uh, her car's in the garage. Deb, she's, she's in the bathroom. She must have fainted. She's behind the door. We can't get into the bathroom. We've called 911. We're going to go over to the Fairmont Hospital and we'll meet you there. 
And I was just like, okay, okay. I like, we get up, I run down the steps, I tell Tyler, please pray for Kaylee because something's not right here. Like she would not have done this and she's passed out behind her door and something's not right here. So we get in the car and we're driving down. I'm calling everybody, like her dad, I'm calling my mom and dad, my sister-in-law, you know, you guys got to pray for Kaylee, got to pray for Kaylee. And that's what he did because when you need something from the Lord, you pray. And I was just praying, oh, just let her be okay. Just let her be okay. Just let her be okay. Almost to the point of bargaining, like, I will do anything. You let her be okay. And then as I was driving down, I kept saying to Scott, why, why doesn't Mary call me? Why doesn't she call me? There's something wrong. And he's like, don't, don't make up a story. And I go, why is not pretty soon she calls me? And I'm like, Mary, is she okay? And on the other end of the phone, it was a police officer. And he said, is this Kaylee's mom? And I was like, just don't say it. Don't say it. And he said, I'm sorry. She didn't make it. And you know, that never crossed my mind, really, that she wouldn't make it. What do you mean she didn't make it? Like, what does that even mean? How do you go and have someone you talk to every day and, like, they're not here? And those of you who are experiencing that, of someone that you love, that's been by your side and now they're not here, it's such an empty feeling. And I remember going really dark. Uh, Kaylee passed away of something that's called SUDEP, Sudden Unexpected Death from Epilepsy. 20 bucks, who's got it? <laughs> 40 bucks already, keep the phones on. Keep the phones on, that was a good break in the action because I was getting a little teary-eyed, right? All right. Um, SUDEP, Sudden Unexpected Death from Epilepsy. It's some, it, it, she was perfectly healthy. They don't know why she died. She went into a seizure and she didn't come out of it. And I think the thing that upset me so much, because in grief so often there, there's just this anger, is that I had said to the doctor over and over, she seizures long and hard, long and hard. I feel like someday she's not going to come out of it. And he told me, that's not going to happen. And then after she dies of that, she dies, I call him and I'm like, Kaylee died, oh, it must have been sued up. Well, what in the world is that? What is that? And I would, yeah, so there's a whole long story of me uh, sure that the doctor did something wrong because we had just changed her medication and uh, uh, it was just a tough, tough time. And so my hardest thing is when we were in the car, I, it was just a complete darkness that came over me, a complete emptiness, almost to the point where I couldn't cry. I couldn't think, I couldn't, I was just blank. Uh, kind of that shock, I think I was just in complete shock. And the thing that was the scariest for me is that I even said, like, do you think God knows about this? Do you think he knows this happened? Do you think he even cares? Do you think he's even real? Do you think that Maybe this was made up my whole life. I just, I was born a Catholic and I just went to church all the time. Do you think this was, and I questioned my faith. You know that unconditional faith? Yeah, I didn't have it. <laughs> I didn't have it. I didn't even know it. I didn't even, I didn't even, even, I, I was just bl black. And I think when you're already grieving, then, then you don't have a relationship with the Lord to help you through this and you're so empty. It's to me when you, people who don't have a faith, how do you survive such a thing? And so I went to a really dark place, and honestly, my faith was tested. And I didn't know um, even how to pray, because I had been praying. I prayed the whole way, and he didn't listen. So now, what do you pray for if he's not going to listen? And then why do you pray anyways if he's going to answer how he wants to anyway? Can you tell he's a little ticked about all this? You know, but you know, uh, there was a part of me that... I still just like, Lord, I, I, I need help. I need help. Like I knew he was, I, like I still, he was, he was what I was hanging on to. And I have to tell you though, that he did send an angel into my life. Um, and I have to also tell you that I am so blessed because I am so incredibly loved. Um, so many people came to Kaylee's funeral. Um, so many. And every person that came through the line was just like, oh, Dad, we love you, and we're so sorry for you, and we didn't know Kaylee, but we love you, and, or th her students would come through, oh, we don't know you, but we know Kaylee, and we just loved her, so, and they just all loved me, and there was people around me, people were praying, and it was just, I had all these people just swirling around me, and still, I felt very alone, and God sent this angel, and you might recognize her. <laughs> How about that? How about that? 
So I'm tell you a little story, and if she came up here, she'd tell you a different one, but we're going to listen to mine because I'm up here. So we argue about this every time. So anywho, so Chris, let me tell you how I know Chris. Um, Chris was a 4-H mother uh, in, at Redwood County 4-H, and she was a 4-H uh, club leader. I was the 4-H program coordinator. How many 4-H families do we have here? 4-H families? Got a few? Got a few? Okay, good. I knew nothing about 4-H, just saying I was a teacher, so I, I was learning the program. And uh, Chris called me. So we're thinking this was probably 18 years ago. So Chris calls me on the phone, and uh, <laughs> she's crying, and she's panicking, and she's like, um, my daughter is showing a rabbit at the fair, and the dog ate it, and, and now I don't have a rabbit, but can we show another rabbit? And oh my gosh, my daughter is so sad. And, and so <laughs> I'm just like, whoa, whoa. You know, you know, and of course my thing is like, well, of course you can show the rabbit. Like, why couldn't you show another rabbit? Well, you 4-H'ers know that the other ones weren't tattooed. And so therefore... <laughs> She could show the rabbit, but she couldn't get champion. I asked Irene if it was her, but we think it wasn't her. Of whose rabbit? Who was it? Maybe Amanda's rabbit. Anyway, so of course she. So that was our first connection. You know what? It's like absolutely, we're going to show the rabbit. So that connected us. So I knew her over the year. I, I had that position for about seven years, and um, I knew Chris just as an acquaintance, but I knew her her kids really well because they were all in my ambassador program and I just loved them. And so that's how I, I knew her. And then I got a different job as an extension educator, so I quit that job. So I'd been gone from the program for six years. I hadn't seen her for at least six years when Kaylee passed away. But what I didn't know is that she was at Kaylee's funeral, that something in her, through all of this, that she came to Kaylee's funeral and I was not aware of that. So the story with Chris, this is what I know about her. She's Catholic. She prays a lot. She ends her messages with, God bless you on the phone. And may God bless you. I knew that she had seven children and she homeschooled them all. I knew that they did. I knew that she was perfect and so they were, they were too. They were perfect too. And <laughs> he's laughing up here. Bob is laughing because he knows this isn't true. He's like, he's like, boy, you sure fooled her, didn't you? Yeah. So, um, but, but I knew. So I knew that that I knew they were a good family. That's what I knew. I knew they were grounded in faith. I, I knew that they were just a really good family. And I was feeling that um, I was feeling God was punishing me because of my divorce, um, because of my. Um, my part of the, my fault in the divorce because it was it was it was my fault. I it was it was me. So I felt like I was being punished. I felt like I deserved this. I felt God was doing this. I felt it was Kaylee because she was part of my first marriage and I should have stayed in that marriage. And I, so I felt like I was being very punished. And so when Chris, so what happened was Chris, my version, says that she called me and I did not answer the phone. And her message said, "Hi Deb." This is Chris Anderson from the 4-H program. I don't know if you remember me, but I was wondering if I could come over next Tuesday and we could go out to eat. And I didn't answer the phone, and I didn't call her back. And in my mind, I thought, well, I certainly don't eat, and I don't leave the house because I was really sick, and, um, and she was perfect, and, and I'm not. And why would I want her to come to my house? I feel like I ignored her. She says that I text her and said, I don't leave the house, but I'd like to see you. I don't think that's, see, she lies. <laughs> not only is she not perfect, she lies. Okay, so that's her version. Back to my version. I think I, I, think I ignored her. I think that's what I did. But I feel like she was totally Holy Spirit and prompted because really why for someone she hadn't known very well, someone she hadn't seen for six, seven years, that she would reach out and want to, to be with me. So then she called back again and she said, hi Deb, this is Chris, and I was, she knew I didn't go out. So she wanted to bring a meal and she wanted to come in to my house. And I uh, feel like I ignored her again because I didn't want her to come. She'll tell you different. Because she's a liar. No. <laughs> Sorry, I'm telling the truth, you know. Okay. <laughs> so the last time when I ignored her, she said, Deb, this is Chris, 
and I am going to make a meal, and I'm going to come over next Tuesday at 11. And if you open the door, I'll come in. And if not, I'll leave it there. And I thought, and I know I messaged and said, okay. So in me, for, it started out, we were, she wanted to take me out. It started out she was going to bring something to me, and then it didn't matter if I answered or not, like she was coming. And in grief, that, that's, I think that it was awesome because I was so messed up. I couldn't make a decision, and she just came to my house. And now me, with my grief, I was really... Um, imploding on the inside. It was very physically painful. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. Um, with Kaylee, she was sucking the life out of me. All I could think about is she wasn't here. Even though I had all the other blessings around me, she was like sucking the whole life out of me. And I honestly, I just did not want to live at all. Even though I had all the blessings, I didn't want to live. So Chris shows up at my house, and she'll tell you her version of the story, which I do agree with this, is that um, she, she didn't know if I was a Christian. She didn't know anything about my faith background. But she was coming to see this broken woman. She saw me at the funeral, how broken I was. And that's why she was so drawn to come and be with me, because my son Tyler was on one side and my husband was on the other. They literally drug me down, up and down the aisle. I was just an absolute wreck. And so Chris showed up at my house, and I feel that when she came to the door, that she had just said, you know, Deb, you know, God's asked me to come and pray with you. And I really feel that God did ask her to come and pray with me. And there's something about Chris that is just, it's so, um, it's so beautiful that I felt the presence of God with her. And so she came into to my home and she asked me, uh, she asked me two crucial things. There were two things that she did and I think this is good for people who want to help someone in grief. Um, the first thing that she did is she said, tell me about Kaylee. Just, I didn't know her, so tell me about Kaylee. And she gave me an opportunity to talk about Kaylee and to bring her to life. Because it, most everybody else knew Kaylee, so no one was asking me about her, so I was able to tell her about Kaylee. And that was able to get this communication going. And she'll tell you that the Holy Spirit told, she knew, the only thing she knew was she, was she needed to ask about Kaylee. And so she did. Because so often in grief, you get a lot of this, you know, I'm praying for you. You know, I don't know how you do it. I couldn't do it if I were you. Um, well, God must have needed another angel. God only takes the best, you know. You'll see her again. Well, at least you have other children. You know, like there's all these things, and they're all emotions like this. They don't open up. Um, and they're, and, and they, they're all like this, but this was an opportunity for me to talk, which was really important to get me going. And then, the other thing that she said to me was, I've seen people grieve before, Deb. Never, never like this. Never like this. Is there anything other than Kaylee's dying that is bothering you? And I felt like the top of my head just blew off like a volcano because I had so much that was bothering me. I uh, talked at Shirley's businesses that I felt like I had something that was called imposter syndrome where people genuinely loved me, they really did, but I'd done a lot of crappy things, and I was very ashamed, and I had a lot of shame, and I had a lot of guilt deep down inside, and I felt that if people really knew the real me, if, like if they really knew me, they wouldn't like me. And so when everyone came through and told me, and, and they, like we're talking thousands of people came through, I felt like I fooled them all. I felt like I fooled them all. Here I was a sinner, that God was punishing me, I was no good. Guilt is when you, did, you feel like you did something bad. Uh, shame is when you feel you are bad. And that's where I was. And she allowed me to just pour that out and cry. And for me, I was telling someone who really was perfect in my eyes. And when I got done telling her all my, my junk and all my crud and I got it out, the first thing she said was, she said, with no judgment, she goes, oh, so you're not perfect. <laughs> you're not perfect like the rest of us. That you're not perfect like the rest of us. And I was like, she goes, Deb, honestly, the way you run the 4-H program, the way my kids love you, the way this community comes out, the way people, you really come off like you're pretty perfect. See, I did fool everybody. She, you know, she goes, you're not, and neither am I. We're all sinners. And the second thing, she's like, God loves you so much. You just dump that, you repent that. He, he has forgiven you. Like this, there's no condemnation from east to west. He does not remember. Just, you just dump it, girl. Like You just dump it. And I think another important thing with her, what she did, is that she shared with me some of her hardships, too. 
And you know, she's not perfect. <laughs> but nobody is. Isn't that it? Just, I think the more vulnerable I find in the work that I do, the more vulnerable I am, the more that I share my hardships, the more, I think a lot with Kaylee and I too, we were best friends, but we were also, we fought at each other a lot. And I always thought of all the ways that I was, like I failed as a mom, all the ways. And then when I talked to, to uh, Chris, who has, what, five daughters, Irene being one, and she tells me once in a while they get lippy with her, and she gets lippy with them, that makes me feel good. Yeah, so, yeah, do you, yeah any, anyone ever argue with their parents in here at any time? You know, like, yeah, I mean, so I, I'm just like, okay, thank you. It's, but for me, I was just really punishing myself. So she, and when she prayed, but well, then after that, she wrapped her arms around me, and she just prayed with me, and it was the, the deepest, most, I, I thought I was going to get an Our Father, a Hail Mary, and a Glory Be, which is good, uh, but, uh, those Catholic prayers, because I'm Catholic, and that's what I was, but this was an all-out prayer of just asking that I was going to dump my pain, all of it at his feet, and I wasn't going to carry it anymore, and that he was going to carry it, and that he would open up spaces for healing and for blessing, and, and it was just, it was massive, and I, I just felt, I felt, uh, I felt the Holy Spirit jump in. Like, I, I felt it. It was, it was I, I felt it. When people ever, ever think, like, when, when did you know that you were saved? I, I, it was at that moment that I felt it. And I also, she had a relationship with the Lord that I didn't know was possible. I didn't know it was possible because, you see, I realized that I showed up at church like this on Sundays because I was supposed to. So I showed up like this. And I remember even leaving church sometimes and my dad would say, hey, Deborah, what was that homily about? Yeah, I don't have any idea. But the girl in front has a really cute hairstyle. No, <laughs> well, I'm not that bad, but maybe. But you know, what? have you ever sat through a whole church service? And you're like, what were the readings? What was the homily about? No idea. You're shaking your head. Thanks for that. It makes me feel better. I'm not the only one. But I showed up. You know why? Because we're supposed to. I'm obligated. I'm supposed to come on Sundays. I put in my due diligence. I did it. I came. But this is not how you build a relationship. It's a great start, but this is it. I even taught religion class because that's what I do. I taught religion class. I gave money to the church. I did that too. I, go to com I, go I was confirmed and baptized, and, and we pray before we eat. You know, bless the Lord for these are gifts which we're about to receive from the month. That one really, really fast, and now I lay me down to sleep and pray the Lord for to keep those really right. And to the, where the words just roll off, but for me, I never really took the meaning of it. And so I realized with Chris, I wanted what she had. She had a relationship I didn't have. And I think that it says a relationship with God is the most important relationship you can have. So embrace it every day because I was missing a relationship with the most per important person in my life. And when I said to you, you know, he was first. No, he wasn't. He was not. He, Keely, my mom, my dad, my kid, everybody is here. But I didn't know that until she passed away. I had to work to get God first in my life. He had to come first, unconditional faith, no matter what. And here it says, still I will praise, the power of praising God, even when you don't feel like it. And this was tough for me because I tell you, I did not want to praise him. But I just, I started, I would, I would be on my knees, my head against my bed, and I would be like, thank you for giving me Kaylee for 24 years. Because Kaylee was sucked on my face. And, and whatever you're going through, whether you're going through a hardship with a relationship, whether it's an addiction, whether it's with a, a child, whether it's something that happened to you, it, it just, that problem just sucks on your face. And I needed to get it off. And the only way you can move your problem is by focusing and being grateful to God. Thank you for giving me Kaylee for 24 years. Thank you for allowing me to, to hear, to see her love someone. And that I, I saw her say yes to the dress and I saw her in the dress. And I knew the names of her children and, and for all the amazing times we had so I could move her off my face so I could see the blessings. There's so many blessings in life. And I was focusing on what was gone, not what, what was here. I was focusing on what was taken and not everything that God had given me and praising him. And it says, and having an attitude of gratitude and just being grateful and just thanking God will change your life. It says to live is to suffer and to, to survive is to find meaning in suffering. And like I said, if we're just going to suffer to suffer, uh, then that's just a waste of really good suffering. And so when Keely passed away, my husband Scott said, let's do, on Keely's one-year anniversary, let's do a 5K, and let's give all the money to epilepsy, and let's give the money to her students at Martin County West. And I, it, was, it was phenomenal, because it made me go, yes, 
yes, like when people donate money, like they can give it to that, you know. So now we had a plan and a purpose. And so what's, we didn't do this because Kaylee loved to run. In fact, Kaylee hated running altogether. And, but uh, she is, uh, she wanted to do a couch to 5K. She wanted to do a 5K. I'm someone who, like, I ran all my life. I was in track and cross country, and I ran marathon. Ah, uh, mar Anyone run a marathon in here? Oh, don't do that. It just wreck your whole body. So, but anyway, but I just was a natural runner. Um, you know, and I was somebody, too, who, like, okay, I'll do a 5K. Oh, now I'll do a 10K. Oh, now I'll do a 10 mile. Okay, now I'll do a half marathon. Oh, now I'll do a marathon. And then I did it, and I'm like, well, now what? You know, like, you're always setting goals, and then you get there, and it's like, well, pfft. You know, you're still like, I think I was just always empty, searching for something, and it was, you know, I was searching for the Lord. But Keely wanted to run this, uh, Couch to Five, so I'm like, great, I'll run it with you. And then uh, her friend Mary, number 206, she is the one that found her in her, her apartment. Jesse goes, said, I'll run it and push Connor. My husband ran it, Tyler ran it, Josh ran it. And I remember when we came over the, the uh, finish line, I'm like, way to go, Kaylee, way to go. Are you going to do this again? Never. I'm not ever going to do this again as long as I live. But we decided because of that, because of how hard she tried, that our family did it together, that on her one-year anniversary, because anniversaries are hard too, on that one-year anniversary, we're going to do something great, and we're going to celebrate and bring the whole town together. That's what we're going to do. So we were in plan. And so we needed a race slogan. And so I thought, you know, well, epilepsy sucks. <laughs> Tyler did not think Keely would want that as her uh, legacy on a bracelet, you know. So he came up with this slogan, be kind, give more, stay humble. And KMH are Keely's initials, Keely Marie Hoag. Um, it's a slogan I've got on shirts, uh, it's, it's on our bracelets. And he would just say, Mom, you know what, we're just going to be kind to everyone, and we're certainly going to be kind to ourselves. We're going to give more and give more to God and give more to others because people are going to need it, and we're going to stay humble, and we're going to give it all to God. We're going to ask for help when we need it, and we're just going to turn it over. Pretty, pretty wise of a 20-year-old um, a boy um, with that type of wisdom. So that's what we did. So we had a race coming up. We had a slogan. We had a plan. I was busy planning this race. Things was good. That was the plan. But dealing with holidays, we had a nine-month anniversary of uh, nine months after Kaylee passed away, which was actually March 5th, 2014. And I don't know why this was so hard for me. And I think it's because you have a baby maybe in nine months and she was gone. I don't know what it was, but it was hard. But not only for me, um, my husband, my parents, they all came to my house. Um, my, uh, both my bonus children, Jesse had three boys at the time, and Tyler came to my house, and, and here's Tyler. And we were together, and I, that was the first day I remember I felt joy. And so I remember I was looking at Tyler, and I'm like, Ty, I feel joy for the first time. I feel joy for the first time. And where it says, love your family, spend time, be kind, serve one another, make no room for regrets, because tomorrow's not problem promised and today is short. This is something that is so true because Keely was just gone in an instant and we know that for some of you who have experienced that and myself, like I don't know if I have more than today or tomorrow or the next day, it, we could be gone just like that. So it's so important that we love our family and that we really talk to them and some cool things with Tyler that I have to tell you is that Tyler really struggled uh, probably as much as I did. I just didn't see it. Um, and as Tyler was falling apart one time and he was just really struggling, I, for the first time, wrapped my arms around him and I prayed with him just as Chris had prayed with me the first time ever. And I just prayed that he would dump all the pain and that God would feel him and that he wouldn't carry it anymore. And he just melted like putty in my arms, just like I melted in Chris's. And then when I got done, he's like, Mom, that was so good. And I'm like, I know it. It was so good. And so it's when we started to pray with each other. And then I gave him a Jesus Calling book, and I will talk about that a little bit. But he w went off to college, and uh, uh, I, every night we would read Jesus Calling together. I'd call him, and we'd read it, and then we'd pray. And then uh, his friends would be like, hey, where's Hadley? You know, oh, he's praying with his mom. On the, you know, so there was just like so many cool things that had happened. Um, in the suffering that Tyler and I saw each other, and uh, 
we talked about heaven and what it was like and um, you know how excited we were to go and that you know we knew Kaylee was in good hands and someday we'd see her again it was amazing and so this particular night as he was leaving to go back to college um, I said to him I go uh, I was looking up at him I'm like Ty I, I just I just need you to know that if the Lord should bring you to the kingdom because he could because he did to, you know with Kaylee he could if, if he should do that I just need you to know that like you're one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given me. I'm so grateful to be your mom. And, you know, and he's looking, hey, mom, thanks. <laughs> like, and I'm like, and Ty, I had a lot of regret with Kaylee because sometimes we were like just oil and water. But I'm like, Ty, I, if, some, if, if you should go to the kingdom, like, I'm not going to have any regrets with you because you're spoiled rotten. And he's like, I know, mom. And he really was because he was such a mommy's boy. You know, Ke Kaylee was probably better behaved but, you know, Tyler knew how to act to his mom. Oh, mom. You know, he did everything I said, but then he, you know. So anyway, he just got away with stuff. And then I'm like, Ty, I said, and if, if, if something should happen to you, just say hi to Kaylee and just know that I'm just going to need a lot of help down here. And he's like, okay, mom, I'll say hi to her. And then when he went to kiss me on the cheek, I was like, no, 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 kiss me, kiss me on the lips. And, and he did. And my husband goes, what is wrong with you? Oh my gosh. And everyone's like, oh, I go, I, I just, I, I know, I, I just don't want any regrets. I just, I want you all to know how much I love you and how much I appreciate you and, and how grateful I am for all of you. And so he went to college and then uh, two days later, I went to a conference and that conference was called Set Apart. And I, one thing that I did is that I knew that I would not survive if I didn't know the Lord. I needed my husband, like I was changing from the inside out. I, Chris was a savior to me. I would be having so much anxiety and I would call her, I'm like, could you just pray with me? And in her busy schedule, she would just come to me. Uh, we had a group of us that would, were reading the Bible. We were trying to do, you know, just, I was going to daily mass. I was just surrounding myself, filling myself with the word as much as I could. Um, and my sister-in-law said, let's go to the Set Apart Conference. God will make a way, Isaiah 43, 19. Because God sets us apart. And we know that. He sets us apart. We were created. We were put on this earth, not because of, for our will, but for his. And what are we set apart for? So we go up to the conference, and it was a two-day conference. And so that night, after the first day, it was good. I was still really very frail and fragile from Kaylee's passing. I'm still struggling, and when I got to the room, I called my husband, and just to see how things were in sleepy eye, and he said, oh, Deb, there's a really bad accident in town. He said, um, this morning, uh, it was really warm out. Ty and his buddies were out. They even shoveled off the, side, or off the driveway. They were shooting hoops. He goes, that it got really, you know, the temperatures dropped, and the, and the water froze on the roads, and it started to snow, and he goes, there's a super bad accident. Air ambulance came in. He goes, there's fire trucks and there was ambulance and there was like police cars. He goes, it's really bad. And so I was like, okay, um, well, where's, where's Tyler? And he said, um, well, he was sitting on the couch here with John. They were eating a Subway sandwich and, um, and they were watching the Timberwolves and they were losing. And so then Kansas called him and at halftime, they just went uptown to the Senex station. They were just going to meet uptown. And he goes, it wasn't that long ago. I'm like, okay. So I text Tyler and I said, hey, Ty, just heard there's a really bad accident. I just need to know that you're okay. And uh, I didn't hear from him. And that bothered me because uh, Kaylee, I didn't hear from her. So it bothered me. But I'm like, my sister-in-law brought people into our room and we started talking about Kaylee and the way God was coming into my life. And I had a, an amazing sign of a purple petunia from Kaylee, which is a whole nother talk. Have me come back for that one. It's really good. Uh, so, I, but it's, it's about a purple petunia that showed up and that just, um, and so I was telling the story and, and it, it's just amazing um, of how God was showing up in my life. And so then they left and now it was about 10 o'clock and I was like, I called my husband. I'm like, have you heard from Tyler? And he's like, I haven't heard from him, Deb. I go, I haven't heard from him either. So I called Tyler again, and I'm like, Tyler, this is your mother. I need you to give me a call right now because there's this accident. I need to know that you're okay. And he didn't answer. And then I called John, who was with him. I'm like, Ty John, this is Deb, and I know that you're with Tyler, and there's this accident. I need to know you're okay. And he didn't answer. And then I called the, uh, Stephen, a friend of theirs, and he was up at the Senex store, uh, the C store in town. And I said, Stephen? And now this time I'm starting to panic. I go, 
there's an accident in town and I don't know where Tyler is. Do you know where Tyler is? And then he's like, you guys, where's Hadley? You got, and, and then everyone in the sea stars starts screaming. And so I'm like, oh my gosh. I go, I don't know where Tyler is. And so I got off the phone with him and I was like, I'm gonna call the police station. And I'm in the bathroom because my sister-in-law and her daughter are trying to sleep. And my sister-in-law comes into the bathroom and she's like, Deb, just go to bed. Tyler is okay. Stop worrying. And I said, he's not. I know he's not. So then I called the police station and I said, this is Deb Hadley and I need you to tell me that Tyler wasn't in the car. And the police officer goes, um, um, oh, uh, we're on our way to your house right now. I said, well, I'm not there. I'm three and a half hours away and I'm not there. I said, I need to know if he's in that helicopter and he has a fighting chance or if he's already gone. And he said, I'm sorry, he's already gone. And I remember that, just that really black feeling and I'm like, and in the same breath, he said there were four boys that died in the accident. And instantly, it could have been a number of people. Tyler was just an amazing boy with so many different groups of friends. And I'm like, who were they? Who were they? He's like, oh, I can't tell. Oh my gosh, you are going to tell me who they are. And my heart just went out. And so um, John is the boy in the yellow. Um, he was sitting on the couch with Tyler eating the Subway sandwich. He would have never been in the car had he not been with Tyler because he really wasn't friends with the driver, but Tyler was. So it was uh, Peyton is, um, the driver's name was Kansas. Peyton is his brother. Um, Peyton was a sophomore in high school at the time. Peyton was cruising around with this boy named Caleb. He was a senior at Springfield High School. Uh, we didn't know that boy, uh, but those two were cruising around and John and Tyler were together and Kansas had asked them to come up to, the, to just cruise around a little bit in town. And they got in the car and they were probably in the car for three minutes. They just went straight. There's the first curve just around town. Uh, they went around the first curve. It was glare ice and they should have just gone off the edge, but they skid and they, they ended up skidding and uh, hitting a uh, three quarter ton pickup. The pickup was going 30 and the car, they were going 50, but the skid caused all four of those boys to die instantly. And then the, dri uh, the driver was airlifted. And so um, I remember just saying, you have to save Kansas because a mother can't lose two children after, because I already knew what this felt like. And I felt so bad for all the other families that had to go through what I went through. Got off the phone, I fell to the ground, and I remember going, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't. It was so physically painful the first time and I was starting to live again. And now it was just gonna happen all over again. I'm like, can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. I remember like I pretty much woke up the whole hotel. My sister-in-law had to get me ready to get out. I mean, I couldn't even very function. And then as we were getting out, like I just felt, I just felt the Lord with me. Like I just felt him pick me up and I just felt um, that he was like, focus on me and not the storm, just focus on me. And so I did, I had to focus. I had to keep my mind like right here and just focus on him and not the storm. And I just knew that him bringing Chris into my life and that Chris praying with me and that me praying with Tyler and me starting a, a blog, which I'll talk about, and people were watching me. People were following me. People watched me grab onto the Lord. People watched me not turn away. And I knew people that I, the Lord was going to use me to help other people. I knew he was going to do that. So that night, it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saved those whose spirits are crushed. And that night as we were driving home, we had like a three and a half hour drive in a snowstorm. The whole way home, I just kept thanking God. Thank you, just for giving me Tyler for 20 years. God, what a great kid. And I just went through all the great things. And thank you for giving me Kaylee, Lord. And I know that you're gonna use me to help these other families. Just give me this. I mean, I just, I just talked to him the whole entire time home. When I got home, my house was full of people. We live on a corner. There were cars everywhere. Kids, people were in and out because they felt God in my home. That's what happened. People were coming to our home for comfort because they knew that they would find God there. And I came in and we brought the whole group of people together 
and I led everybody in prayer. We prayed for Kansas. We prayed for hope. We prayed for the families. We called Father. Father came, prayed with us. But people came around the clock. And as Chris will tell you, I was never alone. People came constantly because they felt God in my home. And it was truly unconditional faith, trusting God no matter what, putting him first above my son, my daughter, that no matter what happens to me, no matter what is taken, that I have him. Because nothing can hurt us if we have him. And Kaylee's funeral, where they drug me up, Tyler's funeral, I got up and spoke. And I said, we're going to trust him that this is a good God. But we better all examine our lives and what we're doing. And if we're claiming the Lord as our Savior, and what is the most important to us? We have to stand before him. We have to know him. We have to trust him. And we are going to trust in him, and we are not going to turn away. Some crazy things with that, too, is after I got done, I spoke for 15 minutes, and I don't even know what came out. Chris said the Holy Spirit was, like, right above you. And I was like, um, but the kids, they had, just, they had just buried, so they had John's wake, and then John's funeral, Tyler's wake, and then Tyler's funeral. And there was a carload of kids that were coming to Tyler's funeral, and one of the boys said, how could a good God do this? Like, how could a good God do this to this family and to this community? I am so mad at God. And then after Tyler's, when after I spoke and they left, like this lady said to me, she worked at the bank, she goes, I saw her a couple days later, she goes, Deb, after we left Tyler's funeral, like, we felt happy. Like, we felt happy. She goes, and I asked my son, do you still, are you still mad at God? Well, I'm not as mad, but I just don't quite get him. But they left his funeral and they felt happy because we were focusing on God and his goodness rather than the sadness with what we were uh, enduring. It says, faith doesn't exempt us from difficulties. The storms of life come to every person, but God will not allow a storm unless he has a divine purpose for it. And so for me, in the work that I do with bereavement, I hear over and over and over, over and over and over, you know what? I went to church. I was on the board. Our family did everything. People looked at our family and said, that family, that is the best. They follow Christ and they trust him. And look what he did to us. Look what happened. Because so often in our prayers, we feel like, do we follow God? So Because then we think we're going to have a bubble around us and we're going to be okay. But that is not faith. That is not what's going to happen. The difference is, is that we have him. The difference is we know that there's more than this world, that there's a world waiting for us. And he tells us in the Bible, thy kingdom come, thy will be done all the time. It's now Tyler and the boys died three months before Kaylee's 5K. And so my committee is like, Deb, we don't have to do this. And I'm like, doggone right, we're going to do this. I mean, we're going to make good come from it. So nothing was going according to plan, but this Bible verse, God promises to make something good out of the storms that bring devastation to your life. I think like Mothers Against Drunk Driving started because someone lost their child to junk, drunk driving. Like, that, like every organization that's out there usually came from a hardship of some sort. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, oh gosh, is it Joyce? Dr. Ruth, Dr. Joyce. No, his daughter died too. Did you know that? Dr. Sorry. Um, I don't know. can't remember what that is. Okay. But God promised to make good out of something. So let's just keep going so we can finish this off. So uh, we called it Keely and Tyler's 5K instead of uh, Tyler's. And we did a three-on-three -three tournament. I had uh, 250 volunteers. We decided to honor all the kids. Uh, some people said that it was the most holy event that they have ever been to. Um, and uh, Jason Gray, he's a Christian singer, uh, he played for us. I had to stop the runners at 1,000 because we couldn't, I didn't think we'd ever have that many, but we had about 3,000 people at the event. Um, we started a foundation called the KT Humble Hearts Foundation, and we just help those who are hurting find hope in the Lord and get to heaven. And we give them grief, uh, grief support materials and do grief support groups. Uh, these are just some things we'll pop through. And this is all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled. We will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. And so that's just it. Whatever pain and hardship that you've endured and the hardships, 
can be used for his glory when you help the next person in line. So for me, this was a billboard in Alexandria. Um, that's why I became a bereavement manager. That's why I work and do grief support groups is because of what happened. And this is my goal is to help them embrace their journey that they're on and not to miss out on the beautiful moments because there's just so many beautiful moments uh, when people are passing away. And it says, as much as we might wish, none of us will be able to go through life without some kind of suffering. It's just we're going to have to. So we have to learn how to suffer well. And I think that's why I handled Tyler's better, because I'm suffering better. And the next hardship that hits, that's going to be hard too. But we have to learn how to suffer well, because we have to be able to keep moving forward in our hardships. So a couple things. How do we learn to suffer well? Uh, be empowered in the Lord and in the might of his strength. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the, the strategies of the devil. And so what does that? I just wanted to, to show you this. So how do we do that? So many people think that in grief, and grief is not just death, but that grief is hardships in life, that people think that grief will get smaller over time and it shrinks, but the truth is, is that it, it doesn't. It stays the same. We have to grow around it. So how do we grow around it? What are our resources? So this is, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, and God will be with us. And we have to develop a relationship. So I just want to zip through this because of the time. So we have to build a foundation. So a couple things that I would suggest, coming into church. I think it's one of the greatest ways to just be in communion with other people. A Jesus Calling book, if you haven't had one, one of those. Um, someone gave me a Jesus Calling book when Kaylee passed away and said, read it every day because it's the Lord speaking to you. It's a daily devotional. So I read it every single day for 11 years, and it's been a lifeline. Um, Bible readers. And you guys, are you Bible readers? Do you, are you, everybody's a Bible reader? You're lying. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, I didn't read the Bible at all. I just, I went only when I, you know, only when I had to. Uh, uh, and that would have been when my kids were being confirmed, but I just didn't read the Bible. I just didn't get it. It just didn't talk to me. And so my uh, bonus daughter gave me a, uh, that Bible a few years before Kaylee had passed away. And um, I remember getting it and I opened it up. She gave it to me for Christmas. And I opened it up. I was like, this is so thick. And the pages are so thin, and there's so many words on it, and it's a study Bible, and I'm like, I don't even know what to do with that thing. So I just put it away, and I just didn't read it at all. But once I got the Jesus Calling book, and I wanted to start to read his word, uh, there's Bible verses on the bottom. So then I would read just those Bible verses, and then I would read the, um, I would read the study notes. And uh, true story, uh, when we were planning Tyler's funeral, my dad, we were in, uh, in, the, at father's home or the church with father and my dad says to father oh yeah a picture of the apostle paul on the wall and then they were talking about the apostle paul and then we were walking out and i go how did you know that was the apostle paul on the wall and he goes because of the horse the horse what do you mean the horse deborah do you not know the story of the apostle paul on the road to damascus i, go, I don't even know what you're talking about Anybody here not know? No, you don't even raise your hand. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, so anyway, or at least say that. So I go, what? He goes, I go, well, how do you know that? He goes, because I've read the Bible. You have read the Bible? Of course I have read the Bible. I'm like, oh my gosh. So of course I'm Googling, where's the story about the Apostle Paul? And so I'm reading that. Well, as I started to read the Bible, I realized that, you know, that did you know the Corinthians wasn't written by the Corinthians and the Philippians isn't written by the Philippians? And like Paul wrote them all, you know, and that he was killing Christians and that, you know, he, he wanted to kill Christians. And so I just found that as I started to read the Bible, all the stories came to life for me, like that Paul became just one of the beloved and here he was a sinner and killing Christians. So um, there's so much in the Bible. He comes to life, his stories. It's our lineage, like we, our heritage, so to learn about what's in the Bible. So that was a saving grace for me. I read it every day. Praying. I had to get on my knees, and I started to P-R-A-Y, praise him first, repent, ask, and yield. And so I would write that. I'd write, every day I'd write five things. I used to ask the Lord for stuff all the time, and then I realized that he just wants me to praise him. So I would write five things. I'd praise him five things I need to work on, and five things I'd ask him for. And one day I did this, I, I wrote the morning God boost down, and I came up with a journal. Uh, and the purple and teal are Kaylee's wedding colors, orange and black are Tyler's. 
and I wrote a book on my journey on how I built my relationship with the Lord and survived. But this is what, it's a 100-day journal, and uh, you can do this on a notebook, but I have journals like this. So every day I start out with five things that I'm grateful for, and sometimes it's just like, you know, I'm really grateful for a good cup of coffee. I, and I'm good, grateful that I drove eight hours to get here from Alexandria and that there are public restrooms and I can stop and go to the bathroom. I mean, that's like, like one of the, I'm like, I'm so happy for that. And one day I was working on this with a woman and because uh, I do small groups, and she put under her praise, she just like, Lord, I'm so grateful for my, I'm so grateful that I have a job and that I can pay my bills, that I have a car, I have a roof over my head. And then the R is either repent or what you need to repair. And she put, I hate my job. I don't want to go to my job. I can't stand going there. And then in the ask, she's like, either help me to really embrace and love my job or help me get a different job, please. You know, so you can use them together. Or my repent and my repair part is always like, I got a big mouth. I talk too much. One mouth, two ears, listen more, talk less. Being critical. Um, it being judgmental, gossiping, you know, like every time I think, oh, and I try to think of in the last 24 hours, because I do it every day, what am I grateful in the last 24 hours? So I will be so grateful that I was here and that I got to meet you fine people. And then things that I need to work on, usually I try to think of what are things, and when I think of that repent area, when I keep writing the same things over, especially if people frustrate me or I'm doing something, that's what I ask the Lord to help me with, and pretty soon I can start absolving that. If there's someone you need to forgive or someone who, who's hurt you or that there's bitterness in your heart, write it in that repair area and then ask God to help you get rid of that because that just helps, that you just die on the vine. Other things you can do, go to faith conferences, listen to podcasts, hang around with people who can build you up, Bible studies, follow the Morning God Boost. What's that you say? Anyone watch the Morning God Boost? Oh, come on now, here we go. This is what you got to do. All right, so a little bit of a story here. So this is our foundation page, KT Humble Hearts, Deb Hadley. And when Kaylee passed away, I'd read Jesus Calling, and I would write on Facebook. I had a page called RIP Angel Kaylee, and I would write about Jesus Calling, and I would bring, I felt God telling me, bring people in with you so they feel you, but then lift them up and help them find me. So I did. I did that every day. Uh, every day I did that. Well, then when Tyler passed away, I quit because I'm sad. I quit, and people started messaging me, are you going to do that, like, that Facebook thing again? I'm like, really? Because it, it was helping people grow in faith. So then I called it RIP Angel Tyler Kaylee, and then I started doing it. And so I did that 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17. In 2017, this gal came to me and said, you know what, I think that RIP Angel Tyler and Kaylee that's all about Tyler and Kaylee. I think you, like, idolize them. What? I do. I think that you, it's all about you idolize them. I go, what makes you think I idolize them? Because it's R.A.P. Angel, Tyler, and Kaylee that I have Kaylee tattooed on this wrist and Tyler here, and I wear their fingerprints, and I had a ring that says Tyler, and I have a bracelet that Kaylee and Tyler, and I had Kaylee's jacket on. What makes you think I idolize my kids? <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. You know, some people, I'm like, I do. They're like, I think she says, I think you need to change it to KT Humble Hearts, Deb Hadley, and I think the focus needs to be on God. And so I do have a tattoo of a little cross here now because I have to remember, you know, he has got to be first. And she goes, and not only do I think that uh, you should change it to that, is I think you should videotape yourself. I'm like, I am not videotaping myself. I do it at 5 a.m. I don't have any makeup on him in my pajamas. She goes, well, I think you should. Well, guess what? I videotaped myself at 5 a.m. in my pajamas. And so what happened was with that, and once in a while I have a guest speaker. Chris was on with me this morning. Um, but what happened was it was February 14th of 2018, and I knew I would never videotape myself ever in the morning. And um, it was the first day of Lent. And I was just asking the Lord, how can, you know, use me, Lord, use me how you need me. What can I do? You know, and I heard, just be humble, be humble, be humble. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And I'm like, oh, no, I know what that means. So when I used to get up in the morning, I didn't, like, comb my hair, didn't brush my teeth. I just sat down, and I just started. So I just, like, pushed the button, and I, for some reason I said, welcome to the morning God boost. And that's why my book's called that, because I just made it up. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm going to do this 40 days of Lent, just like this. 
and it's not about me and what I look like, and I just, Lord just asked me to do it, like, hope you get something out of it. So I did that. Um, I did it for two days, and the third day, my husband, uh, I was working from home, and my husband walked into my office because I was working with the 4-H program yet, and he's like, yeah, uh, Deborah, those videos you're doing, yeah, I don't like them. <laughs> and I was like, I, you know, I just, I got hot. I was really quick, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, quick to listen. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm trying to be humble here. And I just, I just looked at him and I said, the Lord's asking me to be humble. And then I went back to work and ignored him completely. I'm just like, you know, whatever, you know, like I, yeah, whatever. And so I did, I ignored him. So then I did it again the next day. Well, I was still working down uh, in Mankato. So I, I went and stayed overnight at my parents' home. And my mom, I, I, I'm really very fortunate. I have four brothers, and I'm the only girl, and I'm the youngest. I was the easiest out of all of them. I mean, when you have four brothers and then you're the girl, it was like, it's a good spot to be in. So like my mom, and my mom just loves everything about me and we're such good friends. And I come walking into the house and she's like, yeah, Debbie, yeah, those videos. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't like them. <laughs> I almost bawled. I was like, oh my gosh. I'm like, like I really respect these two people. And neither, both of them, and my mom goes, well, Janice asked me if you were sick. And I go, no, she's just sad. I'm like, oh. I'm like, oh, I don't want to be sick and sad. I mean, like, that's, I don't want people to feel sorry for me. So the third day, I actually took a shower and got ready. I go, I don't know what to do. I, I just said, I'm supposed to do this, but it's, this isn't a pity party for Deb. Like, oh my God, look at her, look at how sad she is. I always feel sorry for her. I, 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 it's supposed to be the word of God. And, and so then I, so what I did is I started like, I get up, I have coffee, wash my face, I pull my hair back, I brush my teeth, I get into it, and then I would do that. So I did it for 40 days, and lots of people started following it. And then after, you know, Lent was over, so what do you do after you're done with Lent? You just quit. I mean, why would you go on and be doing that? You know, so I quit. And then uh, people started, like, are you going to do that? And I had this huge following of people. And um, so I, they, people helped me, like, can you do it Monday through Friday? So Monday through Friday, since for the last six years, um, I have been doing the Morning God Boost, and I have like over 6,000 people now. And some of the videos Chris and I did had thousands of people. It, it's just ridiculous, <laughs> really. But it's, it's just, I'm very vulnerable and very humble. It's not about what I look like. And uh, people will say, I never know what I'm going to say. And uh, it's been very healing for people. It's always with Jesus calling. I always talk about scripture. Uh, but it's been, so it's, it's just a very simple way for me to be able to minister to people through the Holy Spirit. It's just a calling. Uh, other things too, just to help you through, praise and worship music. I, I always think counseling, I went to a Christian counselor. I always think that my dad said, uh, Deborah, when I was young, Deborah, if you ever feel like something's wrong, a, a strong person gets help and a weak person lets life destroy them. Just be the strong person. So counseling has always been, um, I think is just fabulous. Grief support group, any kind of help you can get, whatever, whether it's Al-Anon or, or whether, whatever it can be. Do random acts of kindness for people. Um, and then the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. And I think that when you harbor unforgiveness, whether it's forgiveness of yourself or someone else, it, it, it's a foothold for the for the devil to come in and just put weeds in your heart. It just, so harboring, so whatever, if there's anything that's holding you back, and I did, I really needed to forgive myself. So I really needed um, uh, to the Lord's help to be able to forgive myself through, um, through, through confession. Um, and then it says, take care of your body. It's the only place you live. For me, I didn't eat, drink, sleep, nothing. And Chris just forced me to eat, drink, and sleep. So that was good. And then finally, just to change your mindset. Sometimes you have to let go of the picture of what you thought life would be like and learn to find joy in the story you're living. Because so often it's like, this is not what I planned. And some of you, it's like, this is not what you planned. And so there's these four crosses of the boys. And there was a time I could not go around the corner where those crosses were because that's where those boys died. It was so tragic. I said, but now I went to where those crosses were and I parked my car and I went, I knelt in front and I just prayed and thank God because that's where they met Jesus face to face. That's where they met him. So just changing your mindset. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. 
Everything that happens to us is to give us a hope and a future. It's not to harm us. So to trust him with unconditional faith, knowing that what he has plans for us and that those plans are good. And so my call to action is for you is just to spend time with God, just to, to do that, to clarify your perspective, to bring peace to your mind, to bring you hope, to restore your joy, to remind you of your purpose. And with that, I just thank you. Um, I just, I'm so grateful just because of you know, the Christmas season and coming off the epiphany here. Like, I just am so thankful that God sent his only son to walk amongst us, to teach us how to live, to die on the cross for us, so that there's a place more than what we see today. Uh, and Kaylee and Tyler, I feel like Kaylee, she helped me forgive myself. She helped me find the Lord. I feel she saved my soul. And for Tyler also, that he helped me share the love of the Lord with others. And of course, Jesus died that we may live. And so with that, how about if we close out in prayer, right? So dear Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for the gifts of today. And I'm incredibly grateful for everyone that came out and braved the cold weather just to come and support and to listen uh, to my story. And Lord, hopefully that through that, that it will help strengthen their love and faith in you. Lord, we know that you tell us that there's more than enough room in your Father's house. And if this were not so, would you told us that you are preparing a place for us. And when everything is ready, you will come and get us so that we will be where you are. And we know where, you're go where we're going. And Lord, we know you're preparing a place for us. And some of our loved ones, you've prepared their place and you brought them right where you said you would. And for us, Lord, we don't know if it's today, tonight, or tomorrow, or the next day. So Lord, while we're here amongst the living, help us live this life to the fullest, to see the blessings, to bring others to you, to show grace and kindness to all we meet. And if it's time for us to go, Lord, that our hearts would be ready for you. We thank you, we praise you, we glorify you. And together in the words our Savior gave us, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. And all God's people said? Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Amen. All right, that's it. All right. So what I have, any questions from any of you or... Oh, the horse! Did you all know, anyone in here not know that that was the Apostle Paul with the horse? Because I sat in here for, for morning mass today and looked at that and had no idea that that was what that was. That's St. Paul. That's St. Paul right there. He wrote 13 books. My gosh. By golly, I know all about him. I googled it, found it in the Bible. So. Any questions? Some of you did not know that was him, but that's awesome. Well, there's Peter, there's Paul, and we are parish of St. Peter. Yeah. He's got the keys. There you go. So, all right. Thanks, you guys. I appreciate it. I do have some things if you're interested. Um, I'm, all right. Yeah, I'm going to say a word. Um, so, um, Deb agreed to speak this evening for, without a fee, and she usually does have a fee. So, if you're willing to make a donation, willing and able, we have a basket up here and on the side. That'd be great. And she does have her materials available in the back if you're interested in anything. Thank you, Deb.